Well, could I convince you that I'm an ostrich? Okay, I know, I know that's a strange question to ask, right? But what if I tried? What if I tried to convince you that I was an ostrich? Well, you might ask me some questions, like, uh, because, you, you, because it's obvious that I'm not an ostrich, right? So uh, you might say, well, do you have feathers? And I would say, no. Do you have a really long neck? And I'd say, no. Do you run 40 miles per hour? And I'd have to admit, no, not quite that fast. And uh, have you ever laid an egg? Nope, not there either. Well, if you don't do that, then you're obviously not an ostrich. Okay, I'm not an ostrich. I couldn't convince you that I'm an ostrich. But could I convince you that I am a disciple of Jesus? And can you convince others that you are a disciple of Jesus? I mean, what are the questions that someone might ask? Uh, do you do this or do you do that? What is required for a person to be a disciple? Now, we're not going to talk about all the characteristics of a disciple this morning. But in our passage, Jesus makes some very strong statements about being a disciple. And he basically says, if you aren't this, if this is not true of you, then you're not my disciple. So we'll begin here in Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Now the great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them. Now we're going to stop here for a second. So, so there's a shift in the setting. Uh, and, and a shift in the focus here. Uh, Jesus is no longer at a dinner party with the Pharisees at a Pharisee's house. Uh, that's where we left off last week. But now he's continuing his journey to Jerusalem, and he's being followed around by a bunch of people, by crowds of people, and he is teaching them. And as he's getting closer to Jerusalem and coming, uh, his, his coming death on the cross... He is still very popular. People are flocking to him, but many of them still don't understand what Jesus is all about. And they don't understand what it means to follow him and to be his disciple. And so before we go any further, let's talk for a minute about disciples. What is a disciple? Um, a disciple is uh, a learner a follower. Uh, a disciple sits under the instruction and the guidance of his teacher, his leader, his mentor. And so a disciple of Jesus is someone who believes in Jesus, is devoted to Jesus, learns from Jesus, and obeys Jesus. And as a disciple lives in relationship with Jesus, he becomes more and more like Jesus. So as the disciple spends time with Jesus and following Jesus, his heart is changed as he takes on the character traits of Jesus. And his thoughts and his attitudes and his actions become like those of Jesus. Okay, back to the text now. So, we saw there that there's a shift in the setting and the focus here. But there's still some thematic connections to the previous section. Uh, in, in the previous section, Jesus had told a parable to warn that many people would be left outside the door, outside the kingdom. And that they would ask to be let in. Say, and they would say that they had hung out with him and that, they, that he had taught them. But Jesus doesn't know them, and so they're not welcome. And in that, we saw that there is a difference uh, between, on the one hand, being in close proximity to Jesus, or hanging out with him, or even hearing him teach, and on the other hand, actually listening to him, learning from him, and responding in faith. Jesus, in this new section, will pick up on this idea as well. Also, in the very last parable of the previous section that we saw last week, 
uh, people were invited to come to a banquet. But when it was time for them to come, the people didn't want to come. They were too busy with other things. It, it, the banquet was not a priority for them. They made excuses and they put the, their regular life stuff first before coming. And so they were excluded from the banquet, excluded from the kingdom, and others were invited to come and welcomed in. And so Jesus, in these verses uh, today, will also pick up on this idea of priorities. So Jesus isn't talking to the Pharisees now who were antagonistic towards him. Now he's talking to enthusiastic crowds who are surrounding him and coming after him. And in that crowd, there are some who truly uh, uh, believe and are truly following him. And there are those who are considering following him. And so Jesus tells them what it really means to follow him and what it really means to be his disciple. It's more than just being around him or being entertained or liking some things that he says or coming to be healed by him or to receive some other benefit from him. But being a follower of Jesus changes your priorities in life. And there are expectations and requirements placed on those who follow him. So anyone who accepts his invitation and comes to him is welcome. So everyone who believes in Jesus is saved by grace through faith alone. But along with that invitation to follow him comes the expectation that you will actually follow him. And so Jesus teaches the crowds what following requires of a person. So let's keep reading then. Verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So Jesus is giving some conditions here that must be met in order to be his disciple. In other words, if you're not doing these things, you're not following Jesus. Now, first he says, if anyone comes to me, now this is talking about coming to Jesus in faith, uh, believing in him and beginning that relationship with him. So that's requirement number one. But then he continues on, he says, if you don't hate your father and mother or wife and husband and children and brothers and sisters, then you're not able to be my disciple. Now, doesn't that just sound wrong? Well, I mean, if you don't hate your family, you're not able to be his disciple. Why does Jesus say this? Well, he is using some hyperbole here to make a point. Jesus isn't saying that you literally have to hate your family. Uh, in fact, if he did say that, it wouldn't line up with his, the rest of his own teaching and the rest of Scripture. I mean, earlier Jesus had taught that the greatest commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You are to love people. And God's word tells us to honor your father and mother, not hate them, honor them. And, and husbands are to love their wives, and wives are to love their husbands, and parents are to love their children. Loving others, including your own family members, is a clear teaching of Scripture. And we can see an example of Jesus doing this very thing. When Jesus was hung on the cross, at one point he said to Mary, Behold your son. And then he said to John, his disciple, who was standing next to her, Behold your mother. You know what he was doing? He was looking out for his mom. He was caring for making sure that she was going to be taken care of when he was gone. As the oldest son, that was his responsibility. And he found someone else and said, John, take care of my mom. He was honoring his mother. He was loving his mother. 
So, but Jesus says here to hate your family. But speaking of hating your family in this way is a Semitic expression that would have been clearly understood by the Jews of Jesus' day, the first audience that heard him. See, the idea being expressed is that you love, your love for, for, uh, for one is so strong that it's as if you hate the other. That your loyalty and allegiance to, is so clearly given to the one over the other. Your devotion to one is so strong that your any other devotion pales in comparison. And so when Jesus says that if you don't hate your family, your loved ones, you can't be his disciple. He means that you must love your family less than you love Jesus. In other words, Jesus must be your first love. He is the one you are devoted to above all others. So if the two were ever at odds, it, or a decision has to be made between pleasing one or the other, Jesus wins. Jesus is preferred and given priority. But why would Jesus specifically single out family like this? Well, it's because that's who you're closest to, generally speaking. That's who people are the most closest to. Family is who most people are most devoted to. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But family could also be the ones who compete f with your allegiance to Jesus. Compete with your loyalty to Jesus. You see, they may make demands on your time and your attention that actually draw you away from Jesus. They may want you to do things that a follower of Jesus doesn't do. They may want you not to do things that a follower of Jesus does do. And so they may challenge your commitment to Jesus. And family may disapprove of you following Jesus and may even disown you for it. And then you have to make a decision. Who will you please? And sometimes family is okay with you believing in Jesus, but not with you being fully committed to Jesus. You see, if obedience to Jesus gets in the way of what they want and they want to do and what they want you to do, well, then it becomes a problem. They don't like it and they will try to discourage it. So who are you most concerned with pleasing? Who is more important to you? What if following Jesus cost you your relationship with your family. And see, this was a real possibility for the Jews that Jesus was first talking to. You see, if they believed, that Jesus, believed in Jesus and believed he was the Messiah, and their family did not believe he was the Messiah, they could be cut off, disowned, rejected by their family. And this is still a very real possibility today for Jews and for people from Muslim families, and some people from atheist families. Following Jesus can be very costly, but Jesus must be first in your life. This is a requirement of being a disciple. A disciple of Jesus puts Jesus first even if their family doesn't like it. And if a choice has to be made between Jesus and family, a disciple chooses Jesus. Now, there's one other phrase here that we haven't talked about in this verse. He says, if you don't hate your family members, and then he says, and yes, even his own life. So we say, wait a minute, you have to hate your own life? 
Well, this is the same hyperbole, and it has the same idea. Jesus isn't saying to hate yourself, but that you must put him first, even before your own desires. That means you obey him even if you don't want to. Your own desires and feelings might fight against your commitment to Jesus, but a disciple submits to Jesus. Loyalty to ourselves comes very natural to us. We take care of ourselves. We look out for our own good. And it can easily stop us from being faithful to Jesus, following our own desires. But, a follower, but following Jesus means that he comes first. This may also mean that you're willing to give up your life and be martyred if necessary. Be martyred for your faith in Jesus and for remaining obedient and faithful to Jesus. Now, this idea, the Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 12.1. He said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. To give yourself to him completely. Present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He's talking about laying down your life and submitting fully to Jesus as an act of worship. A disciple of Jesus puts Jesus First, even before himself, before your own wants and your own goals and your own comforts, we love and honor Jesus above all, even above ourselves. Well, now Jesus tells of a, another requirement in verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus has already talked about taking up your cross daily and following him. Uh, this is, has the same idea here. And so he's talking about an ongoing daily way of life. Part of life, part of following Jesus is bearing your cross. And Jesus drives us home by saying, if you don't, if you don't bear your cross, then you're not following me, not being a disciple. If you don't carry your own cross, you're not, you're failing to follow him. So to be a disciple, you must carry your own cross and follow Jesus. But what does this mean? Well, it's a, it's a picture taken from the Roman practice of making condemned people carry their own cross to the place where they would be executed. And this is what Jesus will do not too far from now, not too long after this. But not only is the person headed to his death, but he's also being mocked and he's suffering shame and humiliation in the process. Walking through the streets, carrying his cross. Yeah, I'm condemned. I'm on my way to be executed. And so the cross is a symbol of death and suffering and rejection and mockery. But Jesus willingly went to the cross to glorify God. And so burying your cross expresses the idea of complete devotion, of complete commitment, of complete obedience to Jesus. Even if it means that other people disapprove of you or mock you and mistreat you. It means that you have learned from Jesus and you obey him and you live like him. And if necessary, you're willing to suffer and even die in order to remain faithful or because you have remained faithful to Jesus. It means that you are willing, uh, willingly, uh, you will willingly endure suffering because of your relationship with Jesus and to glorify God. A disciple is so committed to Jesus that he learns and obeys and follows Jesus' way of living 
and willingly endures being mocked, disliked, rejected, and mistreated by the world because of it. Well, having been told these requirements of being a disciple, Jesus now says, count the cost and do it. Look at verse 28. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And so if there are requirements of following Jesus, and those requirements of following Jesus are demanding, count the cost. Consider what it will cost and do it. Jesus isn't trying to discourage people from following him, but he wants people to, to know what they're getting themselves into. He wants them, uh, they need to understand what it means to be a disciple and, and, and what committing to him, uh, what they're committing to when they follow him. And so he appeals to a common, their common sense and he asks, wouldn't you plan before starting a big project? Well, the crowd would agree, of course, it only makes good sense. But he uses this illustration of a man building a tower, a watchtower or a fortress. And from this tower, he could see all around and he could protect his land and his stuff. And, and this could be uh, an important thing to have. So the man starts working on it. And before long, he runs out of money or materials. And he's not able to finish. He's left with just the foundation. So not only does he not have a tower for protection, but, it, but the unfinished project is a reminder of his failure to plan ahead. And it's a monument to his weakness. And everyone makes fun of him. Because he didn't plan ahead and make sure that he could do what he was setting out to do. He's unsuccessful and he is shown to be weak. He fails to fulfill his purpose and becomes a joke. The point is that you need to know what's expected as a disciple of Jesus and do it. If you start following Jesus, but you're not really committed to him, well, you won't keep following him. And if you aren't devoted to him, you won't be faithful to him. It doesn't make sense to start following Jesus, but then not follow him. And your lack of commitment and obedience will stand as a monument to your fa failure. And so you may have, uh, you may then be labeled as a hypocrite. You may become a joke and people may mock you. Jesus is saying, don't be that guy. Know what's expected of a disciple. Consider the cost. Consider what it means to follow Jesus and then do it. Give him your everything. Commit fully to him and live for him. So that means if you are considering coming to Jesus and following Jesus. Or if you already have put your faith in Jesus, recognize that coming to Jesus isn't just about what you get from Jesus. But there are also expectations placed on you. You are saved by faith, but a disciple continues to live in faith by faith. In fact, Paul says in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7, he says, therefore, as, so just as in the same way as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so in the same way, walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught. 
So we make the decision to come to Jesus, and we are saved by faith. But faith doesn't stop there. Faith is the beginning of an ongoing, lifelong faith relationship with Jesus. When we have faith, we continue to grow and we remain committed to Jesus. You see, Jesus never made a call to, uh, to come to him just to be saved from judgment without also calling you to follow him. The invitation to believe in Jesus is an invitation to follow Jesus. And so this invitation to follow Jesus, to be his disciple, is a call to be saved from judgment for sin, to love and be devoted to Jesus, and to live in faithful uh, in a faithful and obedient relationship with Jesus. And so, if you are considering putting your faith in Jesus, know that you cannot do anything to earn your salvation. But a saved person, a follower of Jesus, is expected to actually follow Jesus and to live in obedience to him. And if, you, if, if you've already put your faith in Jesus, then this stands as a challenge to the status quo. Are you really following? Are you living as a disciple? Are you fully devoted to Jesus and submitted to him? Is Jesus your first love? Or did you start to follow? and then kind of slow down or get off the path or walk away. So the foundation is laid, but then you left the tower and built. Verse 31. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. So we have another illustration that, 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 that says uh, it doesn't make sense. It's foolish to not think about what it will take to be a disciple of Jesus. So he tells a story, and in the story there's a king who has an enemy who's coming to meet him in battle. The problem is the other king, the enemy, has a, his army is twice as big as his own. And so he's probably, that other king is probably much stronger than he is. And so a wise and competent king would assess the situation and would consider whether or not he's able to go and meet him in battle and win and then make the best decision. You see, if he can't win, well, he has more to lose by fighting and more to gain by submitting and aligning himself with the stronger king. And so he'll immediate, immediately yield and negotiate a treaty. You see, it's wise to weigh the cost and benefits of following Jesus and to know what's expected, and then to commit to it and do it. Do what's necessary for the best results. And then Jesus continues in verse 33 and says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This verse 33 says, begins with, So therefore... Jesus is making a direct application from the illustration of the kings there and the man with the tower. This is what makes sense. This is what's wise. Once you have considered what, uh, what, what it takes to be a disciple, you do it. Jesus says you must renounce everything you have, all your earthly possessions. And if you don't, well, then you're not able to be his disciple. 
Now this word renounce literally means to leave or say goodbye. But it's used figuratively as well to mean to renounce loyalty to or to break ties with. You see, Jesus isn't saying that you have to get rid of everything you own. But he's saying you need to give up your attachment to those things. Your allegiant, allegiance is to Jesus, not to the things of this world. And so you can let go of things and follow Jesus. Because your heart's desire is Jesus. Your commitment in life is Jesus. Your greatest attachment is Jesus. Jesus is first, and you can say goodbye to anything else if needed to follow Jesus. A disciple gives himself fully to Jesus. Now, we saw an example of this when Peter and James and John were called by Jesus to follow him. Back in chapter 5, it says that they brought their boat to the shore, they got out of their boats, and what did they do? Quote, they left everything and followed him. You see, their purpose in life changed. Their entire focus in life changed. Life was now all about Jesus. And the Apostle Paul illustrates this idea like this. In 2 Timothy 2.4, he says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. He's saying, we don't get sidetracked or tripped up by things of this world. Those things that would take our eyes and our focus off of our goal, our purpose. We live for Jesus. And then Paul also, he spoke of his own life and how his own priorities and attachments changed. In Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8, he says, But whatever, I, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Jesus is first. There is nothing that compares to the value of knowing and following Jesus. So Jesus expects full commitment and full loyalty and love. He is to be our number one priority in life. He is our main focus in life. And it's worth it because he gives us so much more than it costs. He gives us life, abundant and eternal life. He gives us a relationship with God and daily fellowship with him that will last forever. He gives us joy and peace and we could go on and on about the benefits that we get from Jesus. There are definitely costs to being a disciple of Jesus. But there are far greater benefits. But all of that aside, God deserves our all and all that we have. And it's only right to give him 100%. It's only right to renounce attachment to things of this world to commit fully to Jesus. Now, sadly for many, our approach is often, well, how much, or maybe how little, but how much do I need to give rather than you deserve it all, 
It's all yours. Everything I have is yours. What's it mean to follow Jesus? Well, your purpose in life is now bringing glory to God. Your focus in life is Jesus. Your number one priority and your greatest joy and commitment in all of life is Jesus. And when you follow Jesus, then you will be useful to God. Look at verse 34, 35. Jesus continues, he says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the, the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears, let him hear. So Jesus uses another illustration here. He says, salt is good. In other words, it's useful as long as it's salty. It, can't, it, it can be used for flavor, to flavor food. It can be used as a preservative and for other things as well. As long as it's salty. But how can salt lose its saltiness? Well, in Israel, salt was often collected, still is often collected from around the Dead Sea. And sometimes that salt would be mixed with other elements like gypsum or maybe some dirt, and, you know, or other things. But then if the salt absorbed moisture, it would evaporate. And then all that's left is the gypsum or whatever the other elements are there. It loses its saltiness. It's no longer salty. Now, now that it's no longer salty, it's worthless. This pictures a useless disciple. Someone who's not really following Jesus. A person who doesn't keep Jesus first will be like that salt that evaporates and becomes useless. If Jesus is not the focus and priority, you will not be able to faithfully follow him. Then Jesus says that, that the useless salt is thrown away. Now, this could allude to a person who isn't a true believer, not being saved from judgment. It could also allude to uh, the physical death of a believer who is disobedient, like Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. But the image here is vague. But one thing is clear. The salt being thrown away it ties up this image, and it makes the point that unsalty salt is useless. The person who isn't committed to Jesus fails to follow him and is useless to God. So the person who doesn't actually believe in Jesus and, and who, who demonstrates that reality that, that he doesn't believe by not following Jesus, he's not saved. Jesus is, is not first in his life, and he's not useful to God. And this also suggests, suggests that a person who began in faith, but allowed other things to have the first place, and then failed to follow, is not useful for the kingdom either. But what a tragedy to have the opportunity to be used by God but then to be deemed useless because you didn't pursue following Jesus. And then this, sec this section is wrapped up with, with the warning. If you have ears, listen. In other words, do it. Jesus is saying, don't be that useless person. If you want to be useful to God, you've got to stay salty. You're only useful to God if you're a disciple of Jesus, if you are following Jesus. So consider the cost of discipleship. Understand what it means to follow Jesus and do it. Come to him. 
follow him, be faithful to him, and then you will be useful to God. As a Christian, your life has been fundamentally rearranged. Jesus is now the center of all you are and do. Life is from him. Life is for him. Life is all about him. And as a follower of Jesus, this impacts every part of life. Romans 4.18, Paul says, For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. He's saying it's all for him. He has the first place in all things. We are his. So we live to please him in all things, both in life and in death. We live for him. And we are willing even to die for him. Life is all about following Jesus for the glory of God.